Hello, my beautiful watchers. Seeing as I was so slow in fulfilling my Patreon-sponsored request to compare the dumpster fire that was the Golden Compass film adaptation to the book it was based on, the powers that be had time to make a whole other adaptation of it, I figured perhaps I should have a look at that as well to make up for it. So, let's return to the wonderful world of demons, dust, sapient polar bears, and a lot of child murder. So much child murder. I covered most of the book's backstory in said video, but here's a quick reminder of the relevant information. Here's Dark Materials, a trilogy comprising of the Northern Lights, the Subtle Knife, and the Amber Spyglass, was published throughout the late 90s and was the work of British author Philip Pullman. The first book's name was changed to the Golden Compass during publication in America due to the locals getting excessively attached to the working title. They've received some pushback over the years from religious groups who believe that the evil theocracy that rules the alternative Earth the story is set in was a massive subtweet about the Catholic Church. In 2007, The Golden Compass was adapted into a film that, it's generally agreed upon, fell pretty far from the mark of doing justice to the source material. Fortunately, a few years later, Pullman reacquired the rights to his story and, as he's by all accounts a pretty chill dude about letting people buy them, another attempt at bringing his most popular works to screen became pretty much inevitable. BBC One rose to the call this time around, commissioning a three-series TV show to cover each of the books. While the exact amount hasn't been confirmed, this was reportedly the most expensive undertaking in the studio's history, taking a full four years to complete and premiere in 2019. HBO was brought on board to handle American distribution. As was mentioned in my last episode about Good Omens, this time period saw every executive and their mothers scrambling to find the next big thing to fill the vacuum left behind by the end of Game of Thrones. Part of the extreme cost came from their commitment to show CGI demons in as many shots as possible. I assume out of a desire to avoid the criticism that Thrones received for leaving out the dire walls as much as possible. Philip Pullman himself was brought on as an executive producer and was apparently kept very much involved in the writing process. Always a good sign. A gentleman by the name of Jack Thorne took on the role of showrunner. He began his career in the UK writing for original TV shows like Shameless and Skins and had past experience working on semi-adaptations like Enola Holmes. However, his most widely known recent work was on the stage as he converted a story by transphobic author J.K. Rowling into the script for Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Believe it or not, Tom Hooper, the architect behind the Great Cats tragedy of 2019, cajoled his way into directing the first two episodes, apparently simply because he was a big fan of the books and wanted to be a part of the adaptation. Thankfully, he was succeeded by a string of directors with less obvious black marks against their names. As is evidently the way of post throne shows, an attempt was made to force their way into our hearts and minds utilizing sheer star power. Daphne Keene of Logan fame was cast as Lyra, with James McAvoy and Ruth Wilson filling the roles of her terrible parents, Lord Asriel and Mrs. Coulter. In a surprise move, Lynn manuel Miranda was cast to play Lee Scoresby, the Texan aeronaut. Now, I'm not complaining as I don't think it's possible to dislike the guy, it's just a bit of a trip to imagine that he and Sam Elliott have now played the same person. My personal theory is this is because Tom Hooper was planning a coup that would allow him to take over the show by force and turn the series into a musical, but was foiled before he could enact it. But a more likely reason is Lynn was just hot shit at the time. I'm starting to feel bad about complaining about child actors all the time, so I'm just going to say that Daphne Keene was better than the actress in the movie. I was impressed with the soundtrack that, as usual, I can't play any of on YouTube. It was composed by Lorne Balfe, whose resume boasts of the Call of Duty games, two Assassin's Creed installments, and Netflix The Crown. I also like the show's commitment to visual storytelling. Why have someone exposition about the Magisterium's insane levels of power when you can casually pan around to show that the average church is the size of a small city? Before going any further, I would like to remind all present that my reviews are, by their nature, not possible to keep spoiling are free, so if you've not experienced this story for yourself and would like to sans pre knowledge of all its plot twists, now is the time to excuse yourself. And if you happen to be in need of a place to find it, good news! It's available on Audible. And it's really good. It's a full cast of actors voicing all the different characters, over a dozen people working together to make it more immersive. It is just one in thousands upon thousands of titles available in Audible's unrivaled online archives that could be at your fingertips. With membership, you'll receive a credit every 
every month that can be used to purchase any audiobook regardless of price. The credits don't expire, and anything you gain with them will remain yours permanently regardless of what the future holds. Membership also grants you access to the Plus Catalog, which is entertainment you get for free. You don't even need to use a credit, you just get gifted a huge range of original entertainment, guided fitness, meditation, sleep tracks, and podcasts. Audiobooks have really been a game changer for me personally, as I work my way through so many novels each month, but I'm also obligated to do other things by the cruel fates of life, like driving and exercising and housework. Audible has allowed me to combine these things into a much more bearable union. You can start listening right now with a free 30-day trial by going to audible.com slash noble or texting noble to 500-500. That's right, I finally changed it from the Dom only a year or two after I stopped using the name. As the film had been made in the wake of the Lord of the Rings, and clearly wanted to be it so badly it sacrificed elements of the book, and the series was made in the wake of Game of Thrones, my concern was that history would repeat itself, but thankfully that didn't happen too much. To be fair, the book was already pretty dark and involved plenty of schemy political machinations, so if anything, Thrones just paved the way for his dark materials to have a free hand to be more loyal to the book. And I do want to stress that. Plot-wise, it follows the events of the book very, very closely, and unlike its predecessor, does so in the correct order. There were some minor changes, for example, poor Billy Costa was once again subjected to the dark fate intended for Tony Makarios, only this time the emotional weight of it wasn't squandered. Despite seeming like the best possible time to be wearing it, and it being the defining feature of their species, for some reason Yurik and Yofa take off their armor before fighting to the death. The complicated truce that the Magisterium maintains with powerful industry of education is never directly spelt out in the book and becomes apparent through people's actions over the course of the story. The show, however, gives it a name, Scholastic Sanctuary, and it's brought up at least once per episode to drive the point home. But as I said, these things are pretty minor, and overall, plot-wise, it is almost word for word page to screen. Thorn seems to be something of a book fanatic's dream, at least in his attitude towards the job. I mean, the most important thing is being loyal to the books and trying to tell those books as well as we possibly can. The advantage of television is we can slow down. In the film and on stage, they had so much plot to get through, so much plot to churn through, whereas we've got the luxury of having time to get to know Lyra and spend time in her world. So, as a result, we get pretty comprehensive coverage of Lyra's adventure. If you've not read the book or seen the show, some of this might not make a lot of sense to you out of context, but watching my Lost in adaptation about the film can bring you up to speed if you so desire it. Her early life in the College at Oxford with her exasperated teachers and close friendships with Roger the Kitchen Boy. Her foiling of the master's attempt to poison her uncle Azriel, who she later learns is actually her father, and learning about dust and the effect it has on adults. Roger and a bunch of other children getting abducted by a group dubbed the Gobblers, being given a rare magical device called an alethiometer before getting taken into the care of a woman named Mrs. Coulter, who turns out to be an abusive control freak and the leader of the Gobblers, running off and getting briefly kidnapped before being rescued by the Egyptians, then starting a quest with them to rescue the lost children and hiring Lee Scoresby and helping Yurik Bernison recover his armor so they can help with this too. Traveling to the north and finding that poor kid with his demon cut away from him, then getting separated from the group and taken to the lab where she nearly suffers the same fate, save for the intervention of Mrs. Coulter, who it turns out is her mother. After the lab is destroyed by the Egyptians, she and a small group head to Svalbard, the land of the armored bears, to rescue her father being held prisoner there. Lyra gets captured again until Yurik turns up to reclaim his rightful place as the king of the armored bears and kills his usurper. The the battle between the bears and the Magisterium, though sends the witch army, and this time around we get the depressing ending in which Lyra's awful father Azriel murders her friend Roger in order to open a bridge to a parallel universe. Best of all, this adaptation actually understood the assignment regarding the alethiometer and how it is 100% not, and never was, referred to as a golden compass. So yeah, any significant differences to the novel aren't due to things being changed or left out, but rather quite a few things were added that are kind of in a grey area adaptation-wise, because while they didn't feature directly in the book, they could well have been happening in the universe outside of the POV character's awareness. Everybody gets their own sub-arc in this. Mrs. Coulter, the Egyptians, the Magisterium, 
everyone. Even Lee Scoresby, the aeronaut along for a paycheck, is now on his own little quest to repay a life debt to Yurik Bernison. The runtime is bolstered yet more by them borrowing characters and events from The Subtle Knife, the next book in the series. While the idea of other worlds existing parallel to Lyra's is established right away, you don't get any indication that our Earth in particular exists in the Dark Materials multiverse until book two, but in the series, right from episode two, you see Lord Boreal, a character barely mentioned in the Northern Lights, bouncing back and forth between universes and investigating Will Parry, one of the lead characters from The Subtle Knife. We also get to see a bit more of Will's life before he started his adventure, dealing with school life and caring for his mother's mental illness. Uh, we then get a look at his accidental killing of an agent sent to his house and his embarkation on his quest to another world. Now you might have noticed that I was specifically praising the accuracy of the plot and not necessarily the characters. Now this is because in my humble opinion, they are all to the last man, child, and armored bear, subtly, not quite how they were in the novel. With Lyra, for example, they toned down her childish adoration for her father and her mother before she exposed her darkest side to her. FYI, I don't mean that as an insult, she is a child. She still clearly wants to go on adventures with Lord Azrael, but she's not so obviously desperate for his approval like she was in the book, so his constant betrayals of her feel less crushing, and her telling him where to shove it at the end is less satisfying. They're all kind of like this, you know? Azrael is a bit friendlier, Mark Ostra is imbued with more directionless anger about her situation. Mrs. Coulter is a lot more emotionally vulnerable or, you know, just an open rage machine. Lee Scoresby is now a rogue and a pickpocket, and they don't portray Boreal's sexual attraction to Lyra. The list goes on. So all in all, I think the best way I can describe this show is it's the same if expanded story, but not quite the same characters. In general, people seem to be fairly positive towards it, but you won't find many diehard fans, and I, I kind of agree it's good, but... There's just, there's something missing here to make it really engaging, and it's really hard to put my finger on exactly what. It might be the pacing. I mean, that would be ironic considering the way the film rushed things was a huge issue, but with eight one hour long episodes to a single book, even with the parts they borrowed from the subtle knife, it sometimes feels like maybe the show had just a little too much time to work with and was dragging things out to fill the runtime. I still think it's a close enough adaptation to restore cosmic balance after the awful film adaptation though, so has on for that. Looking to the future, apparently season two suffered a bit due to the COVID-19 pandemic, requiring an entire planned episode to be cut, and season three is currently on hiatus. Because I am a sweet, sensitive boy, reading these books and the excessive amount of children suffering horrible fates in them taxes my nerves somewhat, so if you'd like me to cover these other seasons at some point, you're going to have to convince me to in the comments. Be compelling and flattering. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Don't forget that the dreaded YouTube algorithm is a deadly beast hungry for the flesh of any channels that fail to get enough likes, shares, comments, and new subscribers. So any of those things you want to throw my way would be deeply appreciated. Check out my Patreon page for episodes I can't show on YouTube anymore, like Howl's Moving Castle and a series of unfortunate events. Take care of yourselves out there, and I hope to see you next time. A child and demon flee the magisterium Helped by a cowboy who sails on the air pick it up, pick it up. Far to the north, away from evil forces They'll place their trust in the one waiting there Armored bear, paws that pummel and claws that tear Young Veracus in it, best beware Yorick the Armored Bear He's so big! Yorick the Armored Bear much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor. Shelby Hope, Sir Tell Spurdloff, and Trace Carter. Shout out to Il Nedge for the credits music, check out his channel for more parody and original songs, and a huge thank you to this video's co-producer, Kate Robinson. She does some awesome work on her channel, so be sure to check that out too. Being the defining feature of their species. Sir Terry, you're killing me, bro. The printer is not your mortal enemy, no matter what you believe. Dark fate that was intended for Tony Makaros. Macro macaros. Ma maca macadamia maca macaroos? I'm gonna try googling it.